Good morning, everyone. Greetings from what today is sunny New Jersey. You know, I love my data and analytics community. The number of texts and messages I've gotten this morning. Are we okay? Yes, we're okay. I never thought I would live in New Jersey where we have tornadoes touching down. Um, and I know we have hard hit Louisiana, those storms just coming up so quickly. So, um, but I always like to start with some humor. So our biggest problem really, it was our dog. Yep. So he has a raincoat. He did okay. How was your summer? We took a break from the data chief one month um, off in August. I hope everyone had a great summer and a good vacation. And I feel like, you know, I'm the daughter of a disc jockey. Music is my memories. We lost a great one last week, Charlie Watts. So I'm gonna kick us off with a memory, a question. First off, for you younger ones, I guess I, guess I should say, have you ever seen the Rolling Stones? And if so, where? For me, it was only just last year, or, or 2019, at MetLife Stadium. So here you go, Charlie Watts. So you saw him on the big screen there. <laughs> um, and as usual, we have, whoops, that went a little too fast. Let's get back. Hold on, we're clicking really fast today. Um, and so I'm seeing some of the, the chats. Where are you joining us from? And where did you see um, the Rolling Stones? So as usual, we're gonna start off a little bit with um, my setting the stage. What is the problem we're trying to solve? Many of you have asked me, you know, Cindy, we're trying to make the case to bring in ThoughtSpot. How do we position it? What do we do about too many BI tools? Do we shut down the legacy? You'll hear then from Mike King of Bank of New York Mellon sharing his strategies for innovating, converting. What do you do about those RFIs or bake-offs? And then Jessica Lee from Bagel Brands. You might know them through Einstein Bagels, Manhattan Bagels. And then Nick Amabile, who is currently the CEO of DAS42, a partner of ThoughtSpot, Looker, Tableau, many of the great tools in the industry. But he also cut his teeth hands-on facing these decisions for great companies like Etsy. So let's take a look at this, you know, and I always like to do a pop quiz to get us going. Type in the chat. This one, we might be dating ourselves. I think you might only know this if you've been in the BI space for at least 10 years, but we'll have some cool swag, the Data Chief t-shirt, or now you finally see me wearing that hat at the Jersey Shore. So answer this pop quiz. Who or what vendor was the name of the very first mobile BI pure play product? And they came up with these cards when the iPhone first came out, beautiful visualizations. And I might be wrong, but I actually think they started by leveraging Flash and then had to um, get rid of that eventually. So type it in the chat and our head of community, Paula, will share uh, the winner as we go through this. So what's going on? You know, your BI tool strategy, what does it look like? Does it look like an overstuffed closet where you keep buying new and never clean out or organize or correctly position the right tool for the right user and use case? The right tool for the right user and use case might look a little more organized, something like this. It's hard. I ran a poll over the last two weeks. It's still running today if you want to answer that. So close to 300 responses. Now, I was actually a little bit pleased because 38% said they have a clear strategy for innovation. 
But many of you, the business units are buying their own BI tools and there isn't coordination across. 23% said that. Chaos, you own every BI tool, 22%. And legacy, no innovation. This was 18%. This worries me because guess what? Usually the laggards in the industry, there's always about 10% that are laggards. This is a little bit more. What's going on? Is this fear of failure? Or is it the embarrassment that many of you feel? Did you make a mistake? A sunk cost is not a mistake. It's about what was state of the art at a particular point in time. So one thing that I always encourage customers to do is segment your users. Understand their requirements in terms of capabilities. And what's interesting is that oftentimes this is inversely related by the number of users. So if you think about data scientists, they really have sophisticated requirements and they demand a lot of features, a lot of flexibility. As you move out on this spectrum, as you get to frontline workers, the new decision makers as we call them, or even externally to customers, suppliers and regulators, they may not need to code their own SQL, mash data together, bring in Python or R scripts for them, it's more about that consumer grade ease of use. So whose voice are you listening to more? Who's shouting the loudest? Are you being intentional? And for sure, you think of the data scientists, they clearly need multiple tools in their toolkit. It might be R, it might be Python, might be some of the newer platforms like Data Robot or Data IQ. We seem to be very comfortable with this concept. We're less comfortable with the concept of different BI tools. And yet, what's been happening? The original BI tools started in the late 80s, early 90s. They were really the SQL generators that report developers used like business objects or Cognos? And is that a role, a job you want to continue to invest in? As report developers are declining and a new role, the data engineer who uses maybe something like a data preparation product, maybe Alteryx, this is where Alteryx would fit in, or even the newer tools in the cloud, DBT, for example. So over time, visual-based data discovery started on the desktop, and really the pioneers here were uh, Spot, Fire, and Click. Tableau was later. And this really was about the analysts and the information workers originally getting data out of OLAP cubes and even spreadsheets. They expanded later to include native uh, database access. And then, of course, we're trying to enable frontline workers. This might be analytical applications. So the newer ones like Amplitude, or are you thinking about how to embed insight to action, maybe within Salesforce or Workday? Do you build it? Do you buy it? Now, ultimately, I think BI search is the way to go to empower a broader range of users. And I know some of you are chuckling saying, well, of course you think that, Cindy. Now you work for ThoughtSpot, a BI search and AI generated insights vendor. But actually this chart I was creating back in 2013, even before ThoughtSpot searched, uh, before ThoughtSpot launched, because I saw the potential for search to really enable the non-analysts to ask their own questions. So think about how you position these tools by segment, but also think about your appetite for innovation. So I really like this technology adoption life cycle. And it shows the tech enthusiasts will be the early adopters. So you have the skeptics who are always the late adopters. Uh, I do think that's that 18% we showed from the poll. 
But this can change over time. And this is where we lack, many of you lack a strategy for innovation. So always you can think about when a technology is mature, there's mainstream buying. So if I go back two years ago, three years ago, visual-based data discovery represented mainstream buying. What was new three years ago was the concept of search or NLP and AI-generated insights. So you have a new innovation. You have that innovation then maturing. And at some point in time, you have to say, all right, that other mature technology, we're going to maintain it but we're not going to build net new there. This is when you will have multiple tools and you have a coexistence strategy. At some point in time when the new innovation reaches maturity, then you're going to say, we will actually stop paying maintenance. Now, for those of you that have been in the space for more than 10 years, you might've gone through this process when you initially started with business objects or Cognos Power Play, maybe, or Report Studio, and then you were bringing in the likes of Click or Tableau, and you said, well, okay, Click, Tableau, it matured, we're going to stop paying maintenance, and eventually then that innovation will replace. And this is where we see the early adopters of ThoughtSpot. They're only doing new development with the new innovations and they're actually, they have the declining usage of the legacy platforms, and then eventually they sunset. Now the sunset is the big question, and you'll hear from our panelists today, do you convert or do you shut down? And I want you to feel comfortable, nobody made a wrong decision by investing in these tools at a current point in time. Keep in mind that state of the art changes and it's changing faster. And that pop quiz at the beginning, um, we'll see from Paula who got this right, but it was actually Rome B, which came out um, early in 2009, 2011. SAP later acquired them. If you think about mobile BI today, you assume it will be part of your core enterprise BI platform. It's no longer a distinct capability. So this is um, the other thing is the evolution to cloud influences this as well. So a couple best practices, stop striving for a single analytics and BI platform. It's the right tool for the right user and recognize that for innovation, you will automatically have multiple BI tools because state of the art changes over time. Position it by the user and use case and develop a plan for divesting and sunsetting. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and see how is this, is this resonating with you? Um, I'm just having a little, bit of a problem navigating the comments here. Comments are on fire. Um, so happy to see uh, Rupal, glad to see you joining from California. Thank you for being here. Um, a few people are having problems with the sound, hopefully. Oh, <laughs> somebody remembers this, Bill Powell. You do remember Rome B, good. Um, Ellen, okay, you were having, it looks like um, Palace sorted out sound. Have we sorted that all out? Mike, thank you. Yes, the right tool for the right analytic workload. So Mike Lampa from Great Data Minds joining us. Thank you. Um, Mika, you're sharing... Customers have no clue about the difference between analytics, BI, and reporting. So true, Mika. And I think what happens here, the industry uses different terminology, and sometimes we mean the same thing. A thought spot pin board, they might think of as really just a report, and yet the technology, it's kind of like your smartphone. Is it a telephone? Is it a camera? Are we talking the iPhone? Are we talking Android? So um, I think this is all valid here. 
that's where it's up to us as the practitioners to define what is what is the positioning. Okay. Um, it looks like other people are are okay with the sound. Just checking. Shadab, uh, nice to see you here. Thank you for joining us. So now I'd like to introduce Mike King, the Director of Data Governance from Bank of New York Mellon. Mike, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks for having me. And real quick, I just want to reach out to those in the uh, Gulf area. Hope they're doing well, those who are joining. Uh, and those who are in the uh, Upper East Coast, in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. Hope the remnants of Ida didn't uh, ruin their their day too badly. So hope all is well. Hope everybody's doing well. So thank you, Cindy. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Th thanks for that. And I know you're in, are you in New York City or the suburbs? Where are you joining from today? The Eastern suburbs, Long Eastern Island specifically. Suburbs. Yeah. Okay, great. So tell us about, so you got hit last week, actually. Uh, um, no, actually, we more. missed it, fortunately, at least where, where I am. I'm in Eastern Long Island, so. Uh, but we've been fortunate in both in both cases. But uh, again, for those who were affected by Ida and Henri, I, uh, I you know, I, I I pray for them and hope everything is well, as good as yeah. possible. Thank you, Mike. We're we're with we're totally with you on that. So, Mike, you have a big role at Bank of New York Mellon. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your role there and how it relates to um, BI tools. Sure. So, I'm head of enterprise data governance technology. And that means sort of a lot of things. Um, I have a, a team that handles the development of controls. So looking at controls in terms of both regulatory and non-regulatory programs, uh, there are things like data quality controls. We also have uh, data lineage, which identifies the provenance of our data across all of our data sources. Um, and then thirdly, we have the data catalog, which essentially is the, you know, the catalog of like a library card catalog, the catalog of our, of our data. And then we have a glossary, which informs us of our business terminologies and so on. Um, last but not least, and while we're here to talk, is data analytics. So in data analytics, we're, we've identified uh, you know, two main areas of focus. And I think we're here to talk about one of those. But um, so that's really my remit for the entire team. My team is pretty, pretty dispersed around North America as well as in uh, India too. Great, thank you, Mike. So a broad scope and a lot of different technologies. And you brought in ThoughtSpot, I think just over a year ago mm -hmm. now. I right. remember meeting some of the Bank of New York Mellon team in New York, June 2019, I believe it was. <laughs> right. Tell us how you made the case to bring in a new technology because I'm assuming you also have many other BI tools. Yeah, I'd say we're probably, you know, given the size of our bank, we, as most large companies, you know, the quote unquote, one of everything fits us as well. And whether it was systemic or organic, we you know we have, we have, we fit to the one of everything mode. So the, the question really was, why do we need another one? You know, why another analytics tool? And the case was made very simply by saying, if we want to, if we want to do things where we allow the consumers, as we call them, the data consumers, be they newbies or data scientists, as you, Cindy, you had in your previous picture, the essentially the life cycle of or the maturity level of the the the, the industry, you know, within our bank, and, how, and when I say industry, I mean industry in terms of you know data analytics and how they use it, what their purpose of use is, how it helps to. In, in, to uh, enable their business processes, uh, we basically said that they don't want technology, the technology teams to necessarily build things for them. They may want them to teach them how to fish initially, but overall they want to fish for themselves. And that was really our mantra. It was really the way we kind of built out our analytics profile, which is we will help craft the, in, the, in jet, the hydration of the data bring it into the models, and then build out the initial pin boards, but then you're off and running uh, with very minimal help from us. We had we set up a, an adoption model to help them to adopt each different line of business to adopt the technology. But what they really were mostly uh, interested in is, we wanna be in a mode of self-service. 
And ThoughtSpot helped us to do that. That was really the impetus to, to bring ThoughtSpot in. We did a proof of concept. Uh, you know, you mentioned 2019. We did it, I think, in March or, or April of 2019. And then we we went forward uh, with four lines of business across four use cases. And within 11 weeks, we were able to get it up and running uh, and into, into production, which is pretty monumental. Um, and that really speaks to the desire for the team itself to be able to get it in, but also, and, and, the, and, the, and the purposefulness of the use cases, but also the ability for the tool itself, the capability itself to be able to, uh, to meet those needs. So that was the one thing. The second one was the predictive capabilities within, the, within ThoughtSpot. So while we have a lot of other tools, the AIML component of ThoughtSpot was really uh, important to us. So those are really two main areas that help us to decide, yet bring, you know, bring in yet another tool, a tool that was our capability that was very differentiated from all the other things that we had. Um, you know, we, people use Excel to do pivot tables and do, do reports for that. Uh, people use, you know, uh, they can use Cognos or Click or BI, uh, other BI tools, Power BI or what have you. Um, but what they were missing was the ability to not have to have a super expert be able to understand how to write the code uh, that would drive ultimately the dashboards or the reports, you know, be they Rollap or Olap or whatever, and get to and quickly get to, you know, quickly get to where they wanted to go. So that was really key and important to us, those two areas. Great. Thanks, Mike. So I want to unpack uh, one of the comments you made that you were aiming for, for self-service. People wanted to fish on their mm -hmm. own. Right. And yet, if you think of the messaging for these visual-based data discovery tools, whether it's Power BI or Click, they claim they do self-service. How is it different? Or how did you argue that it was different? Hmm. So that's a great question. Um, and so what we, again, we had a proof of concept. So we came in with a particular area of focus. We had a, a small subset of data. And we said, one of, the, one of the parts of the rubric of how we went about you know, solving this problem and, and showing the utility of the capability was to say, it has to be something where we can line it up against and do a kind of a bake off with another tool that was a favorite of the groups that were you know, the line of business and then show how it would take X number of calories to do one and X number of calories to do the other. And then, then we put to the test, okay, now we're gonna back off and you're gonna do your own. So let's see if you can do it. it and that's really, really where won the day. Uh, the utility of being able to show you know, chapter and verse of how a data consumer without a lot of understanding of other than of their data can quickly be useful, you know, create utility and usefulness within the capability was very important to us. And it was shown through that proof of concept. And, and that was very, you know, that was very, very important. Um, and that's what really kind of led us to the decision that this is the right capability. Okay, so it was the bake off did, it, which as you may or may not know, you know, queen of the BI Bake Offs at, at TDWI and then Gartner. I love Bake Offs. I love hands-on testing. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you have seen the difference with an RFI or RFP um, or is it the way you articulated it or no, people really needed to try it before they saw that difference in calories as you call yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Our, in our case, you know, uh, Personally, I'm not a big fan of an RFI. I mean, I, you, you can you can use it in cert, certain instances, uh, depending on the culture of the organization. But I believe the culture of the organization within BMY Mellon really doesn't lend itself, in this case, for an RFI. Um, you know, we I've said this before to many people. You know, we look at a, we look at a, a month as a day. We look at look at a you know a, a, you know a, a, you know what a month you know what day is a month rather uh, you know a, a year is a is a month. You know, or you know, kind of thing. A quarter is a year. In other words, what we what we do is we move very fast. We move we very move very deliberate and very fast. And we really didn't have the opportunity to, you know, slow things down. We knew what we needed, so we didn't want to put out an RFI and have to go through the sort of that process. Rather, bring it in. Let's you know, let's put it into a sandbox environment. Let's do a comparison between two technologies. There was you know there's there's this, quite frankly, uh, in any organization, you'll find that there these are religious wars. 
somebody's holding oh, hold yeah. to click, somebody's holding really hard on to Tableau, and that's their favorite tool because they know it. Somebody's holding on real hard to Power BI. Um, and so to come in as, you know, against these incumbents, it's very difficult. But the power of showing is really, really important. So we wanted to do that right away and say, you know what, you're favoring this capability versus ThoughtSpot. Now let's do a comparison between the two and you can see for yourself, which is very powerful, how great this capability is, how fast you can come up to speed, how fast you can materialize your information. And those who have the information first, they're the ones who win the day. So yeah, that's yeah. What Thank you, Mike. I think you nailed it. They are almost like religious wars because they've invested their skills and time. Mm -hmm. right. um, but you have to innovate. So um, some co comments here. Oh, it scrolled up. So Heather and Leslie going back and forth, they're still looking on one BI platform for everything which I think is possible maybe in a greenfield company, but I would still mix and match then for the data science, you know, the, there. But what would you advise Leslie or Heather here, Mike? I would say again, it's, it's cultural. So it depends on how your, your, your uh, organization is culturally aligned. For us, we see, you know, that we can whittle it down to two, two, uh, two types of technologies serving different groups and for different purposes. Uh, so, you, you know, you're never going to, I don't think you're going to have a one size fits all solution. I think you have to acknowledge that you're going to have a couple of tools, uh, in our case, literally a couple of tools that uh, make more sense. And so there's a higher order of things, uh, you know, in terms of, okay, so if it's sort of rank and file and you're just, you know, you're doing your standard reporting, you don't need to have uh, a sophisticated capability. Um, you can you do it? Yes, but we we reserve the the analytics, the you know the the higher order analytics, middle middle to higher order analytics, with ThoughtSpot because we know we can handle it. We know that it's fast. We know that we can put data up into the cloud if we want to, and it's very quick, very quick in the cloud. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, it's our belief that you know if you're on Azure, for example, in a cloud, you know in the cloud, and you have um, you know you want to put Power BI up there. There may be an issue with that, so you know we, we kind of look at that. And again, that's where it goes back to what's your technology stack, and and how are you organized from a cultural standpoint too. But quite frankly, everybody's going to the cloud. Everybody is looking to to focus on self serve. Um, the notion of I own is kind of going away, and it's really more of we own, and so it's becoming democratized. And the idea is we need to commercialize these capabilities. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm going to bring in our next panelist and we'll, uh, Mike, we'll take some additional questions, comments uh, when we all convene towards the end. But next, I'd like to introduce everyone to Jessica, Jessica Lee from Bagel Brands. Jessica, welcome. Thank you for having me. Where are you joining us from, Jessica? I am in Denver, uh, actually in the suburbs of Denver on the south side. Um, it's beautiful here. So I Feel, feel for everybody who's having um, to deal with Ida as well. But um, yeah, it's a, it's great to be here. Good, thanks for joining us. Now, Jessica, you have a great career um, in data science on very cool sets like, oh, those bagels, that brisket bagel that I saw, <laughs> but also before this Sonic. Tell us a little bit about your role and how it's evolved. Yeah, so um, I came to Bagel Brands about a year and a half ago with the intention of starting the data science function and modernizing our, our BI stack. Um, but even more than that, it was about you know bringing up our data-driven capabilities and sort of elevating the data fluency and literacy in the within the organization. Our CEO wants us to be known for two things, great quality food and data science and analytics. Um, wow. and <laughs> So I'm very fortunate in that uh, that sense to have that um, leadership backing across the whole executive team uh, to really be able to build out, you know, my vision using the, you know, the experience that I've had of, you know, learning from my past uh, experiences of what works, what doesn't work, how would I have done this if I could have done it again, right? Um, and so I had built out the data science function at Sonic as well and our uh, um, CEO at Bagel Brands, I had worked for him at Sonic when he was the chief brand 
officer. So I followed him um, out here um, and and kind of just said, here's my vision. And he said, I love it. Let's let's do it. So that's kind of how that's it evolved. Great. It's, well, it's great that when when data and analytics is elevated to such the top line that it has the CEO's attention, but it's also core to your main product, food. Yeah. Yes. It's um, you know the the food industry itself um is really you have to move so quick um in our industry, and so having insights um and at your fingertips and being able to quickly pivot um you know what your approach is going to be so you can stay on top of things when your competitors are coming at you when the guests um you know opinion changes or um you've got an issue those things are so vital to keeping um the organization um on the top and so really it, you know i love you know the the sense of just being able to use all of that to quickly you know make an impact on not just the guest experience but at the high level um the organization you can really see the effects of what the team is doing um by having insights available yeah that's great so insights at your fingertips you were brought in to modernize the stack so it sounds like there was already a recognition of the need but how did you make the case and maybe what were some of the objections that you had to handle or overcome? Yeah, so um, I would say the the biggest thing was, um, you know, we have the, the difference between operational reporting, so the reports that go out to the field, um, which is what is in Power BI right now, um, and then this need for the self-service at the support center levels. And, um, you know, the idea of, oh, well, we we don't want to have, you know, how do we differentiate the the level of access that um, users are going to have at different levels and um, between all of the different stores and making sure that we can do this quickly, um, you know, make this innovation transition, this modernization without disrupting operations, without, um, you know, creating more technical debt as well um, along the yeah. way. Um, and so really for um, for me, it was about taking the idea of, of saying, you know, here's my five year plan. <laughs> this is what um, my vision is. Getting buy in from leadership with a very clear vision of how we're going to get there um, every step of the way, short, mid and long term. Uh, and then really just digging my heels in and, and starting right away with um, with that, and the first thing um, was a, you know, really assessing the entire landscape of our data um, and, and just bringing to light all of the, you know, either issues I see and why, you know, if we're going this direction, why does the modernization need to happen? If we're trying to get to these um, machine learning and AI capabilities and we wanna have customer facing recommendation engines, things like that, what do we need to do to get there? And then, you know, kind of back into that journey for them. Um, and so by doing that, I, um, you know, when we um, got ThoughtSpot, we really focused on doing a, um, a proof of concept with users from the business um, that to solve a particular problem, um, you know, just as Mike had mentioned, and we wanted to pick something that added business value, something that they didn't, um, have before that would get them excited. But I also thought it was really important to involve business users at different skill sets um, to prove it out. Because I think one of the biggest things, um, you know, that makes a difference is understanding the data literacy and the capabilities of the business, because that will determine what tool, um, but not even just what tool, but how you teach and train the business to use the tool, how you implement the tool, how you set it up. And that's why I also believe there's really not one size uh, fits all. You have to really know your user and you have to know your data. Okay, great. So a lot of good points there, Jessica. The, the business value, um, a different class of users that didn't have anything and data literacy or data fluency. 
I, I actually recently wrote a blog saying, can you actually get to true self-service analytics amidst poor data literacy? Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I think that um, you can. Um, I, I loved your point in the, in the last um, webinar you did about there's nobody that is data illiterate, right? Everybody has some sort of data literacy, but um, I think the level of um, self-service depends on the, the user's capabilities and you can start small with them and anything um, that they're able to do hopefully sparks that curiosity and builds that, which will then um, increase their data literacy as they start digging in and then increase their capabilities and, and passion for becoming more um, capable to you know, provide self-service analytics um, and those insights to the executive team. Yeah, good. So I, I, so I'm, I asked you, not knowing if we would agree or not. <laughs> so I'm glad we agree. I liken it to teaching a child to read. You got to give them some books to practice on, and then um, grow there. But so it sounds like your positioning is very clear. Power BI for the operational formatted reports. Thoughtspot for the self-service. Um, pin boards and and non analysts is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. so right now um, we have since we have operational reports um, in play, our, as we're modernizing the back end architecture um, and moving um, our reporting platform um, to Snow, the back end to Snowflake, we are all the reports that go out to the field. You know, kind of keeping the lights on, making sure that those are up and running, meeting the the SLAs, um, and you know, we have some reports that go out, you know, to 600 users across the U.S. Uh, different granularities, and we wanted to make sure that we kept that there because it's it's um, it's sturdy right now, um, as far as you know what they expect. It meets their needs, and this will give us the time to focus on the back end architecture so that we can improve that, and then also um, implement. Uh, you know, the innovation piece, which is ThoughtSpot for the support center. So that way the, um, you know, the brand managers and the executive team and, you know, marketing and finance can start um, building their data literacy capabilities more and, um, and you know, really learning about self-service. Um, and in the future, we've, um, we've considered um, transitioning um, some of the operational reports to ThoughtSpot. But as of right now, we feel like, you know, the two tools as cells are meeting our needs. Okay, great, thank you. I'll bring in some comments from the community. Um, thank you everyone for commenting and asking questions here. Um, Je or, or let me, I wanted to bring this one in first. Ron John, thank you. You have to teach design thinking, problem solving, outcome oriented. He Heather Hill, liking your approach with the data literacy. Um, and then maybe a question from Jenny. How do you get people to start with what is the question we are trying to answer rather than what is the tool? Yeah, um, so that's always a challenge. I think, um, you know, it, it's kind of that, you know, okay, no, what are you really asking for? What are you really asking for? And I think it's kind of um, this evolution of, you know, showing them that, you can, you know, there's multiple ways to skin a cat, right? Um, but the, it's not necessarily about the, the tool always because yeah. you can get the same thing done with multiple tools, but it depends on what you're really trying to do, what the question really is. And, you, and I think the only way to do that is really showing them, um, you know, that that is the best approach. And then they'll start understanding you know, how to position themselves more to start asking those questions of, okay, you know, or sharing that information because there's there's nothing worse than, um, you know, trying to build for the user that doesn't know what they want, um, doesn't even know what question to ask and doesn't even know, you know, you don't, they don't know what they don't know, right? So yeah. it's about the education level and then they'll start um, being more open to saying, you know, what is the real question here and start sharing those insights? 
Right, great. Jessica, thank you so much. We'll hear more from Jessica in a few minutes. Next, I'd like to introduce the CEO of DAS42, Nick Amabile. Nick, welcome. Hey, Cindy, great to be here. Where are you joining us from, Nick? Uh, I'm out in Eastern Long Island, similar to uh, to Mike. Uh, so we got a little bit of weather last night, but uh, not too bad. So we're, we're doing okay. And certainly thinking of all the folks who were impacted by the storms the last couple of weeks. Yes, thank you, Nick. And Nick, so you're walking a fine line here because <laughs> you as a partner, <laughs> you implement um, multiple tools, but I also think your background starting really as a BI manager at Etsy and, yeah. and others, um, how has that shaped your thinking about all of this? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, you know, to your point, Cindy, I've been on the other side of the table, not just as a consultant uh, and a partner, um, but facing a lot of the same challenges and, and struggles that that Mike and Jessica were talking about. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, tools are a means to an end, right? As you know, analysts and analytics folks, we're trying to solve business problems with data. And so I think there are, you know, really great comments from both Mike and Jessica around, okay, what is the right question to ask and how do we actually achieve these business goals with, uh, with, with the different tools that we have available? Um, but it's, it, but again, it's, it's thinking about those use cases and focusing first and foremost on that, you know, my experience uh, at Etsy and then at jet.com, I, I call it lessons from the trenches. And what I've kind of realized, not just with working there, but also in the consulting firm at DOS42 here, you know, the, the challenges are very, very similar and the strategies that you employ uh, actually drive a lot more value than, a, than any specific tool. So, uh, you know, we always work with our clients first and foremost to centralize their data, to create a standardized semantic layer on top of that data, and then to get data to everybody and to actually drive adoption uh, and usage of data. Uh, and like you were saying earlier, Cindy, there are folks who, who don't know SQL or Python or R. Um, they need data just as much as the rest of us. And oftentimes those folks are, are overlooked. It could be salespeople, marketing, customer service. And as analysts, we can't always anticipate the questions that they're gonna ask uh, or, or wanna answer. Uh, and so really being able to give them a tool that allows them to explore, drill down, slice and dice uh, is, is super critical. So that's really kind of our overarching strategy. And then from there, you know, we work to identify, um, you know, business priorities, use cases uh, with our customers, and then pick the right tool for the job. But it always starts first and foremost from the business cases. Right. So start with the business case. So all three of you have said that today. <laughs> um, but you used a word that makes me a tad nervous: the semantic layer. Uh, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking of business objects universe, a Cognos framework manager model, um, a microstrategy project that might take weeks and months in and of itself. Um, elaborate on this. Have we gotten better, faster at this? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, so I, I use semantic layer a little bit more loosely than kind of the textbook okay. uh, <laughs> sort of terminology and, and really, you know, I think there was actually a comment in LinkedIn as I was kind of listening to the other uh, presenters about the data governance model and how you set up the data model in whatever, you know, whether it's Snowflake or whatever tool you're using um, to make sure that if you do have multiple tools, you have uh, the ability to get the same numbers from both tools. There's a data governance in, uh, program in place to sort of, um, you know, support data literacy, data discovery, uh, all the things that the prior uh, guests were talking about. So I use it a little bit more loosely, or loosely but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we have the right data model in the back end or whatever tool it is, uh, which is a little bit new these days, right? I mean, now we have really great technology uh, in the data warehouse space, you know, ThoughtSpot connects to uh, things like Snowflake, uh, and other tools do as well. And so now instead of moving the data out of where it lives, because now we have big data, uh, so moving data is, is expensive and costly and, and difficult, uh, we're able to connect to the data where it lives. Uh, and then actually that empowers things like slice and dice and drill down capabilities and things like that. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm using it a little bit loosely. So to your point earlier about, okay. about uh, the terminology, it's, uh, you know, we all kind of have a little bit different terminology. So I appreciate you clarifying. Good. So we'll, we'll let you off the hook with that one. So <laughs> one question we didn't dive into, but as you look at your customers across the landscape and your own experience from jet.com, uh, who Walmart later acquired, yep. um, what has been your strategy for converting legacy tools or content versus just shutting it down um, or letting it die a slow, painful death? 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's a challenge that we've we've faced n- numerous times, and we've done it in different ways with different results. So I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons. But I think our overall strategy, and this is something I learned from from my time at Etsy, is using the carrot and not the stick. Um, you know, and, and what that means is basically helping people do their jobs, you know, better, more quickly, saving them time, uh, getting them uh, data that they didn't have before. So getting folks excited, and that was what both Mike and Jessica talked about before was you know, delivering a great use case end to end, as opposed to boiling the ocean first and foremost. Uh, and then that gets folks excited. Now they have a new capability. Now they have self-serve. Uh, and with a lot of BI tools that we worked with in the past, um, you know, it requires a developer to set up and sort of create the the semantic layer, you know, and sort of really set up this this tool. But with ThoughtSpot, we see customers are able to get really quick time to value, I think, as you heard Jessica and Mike talk about. Um, so at the end of the day, it's really about the carrot, not the stick. Uh, and it's again, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, but a lot of times we almost start from scratch when we come to a new customer who's modernizing and we, we work backwards again, just from the use business use cases and identify really high value, high party use cases, get folks really excited about that. So nail that use case out of the park, um, you know, make sure it's very curated to the business users, um, to the use case and, and the business priorities that they're trying to drive. And then what we see is that other folks then start saying, well, I want that for, for, for what I'm doing, right? And other teams and other yeah. organizational units start asking for that. And then adoption grows slowly but surely. Uh, and then sort of the other tool ends up declining. And eventually, sure, you have to shut it down. But, you know, I think at the, the idea is to really get folks excited about the new capabilities. Yeah, I think, yeah, those quick wins are important. So I'll share just some comments. Um, <laughs> and I'll apologize if I get the names wrong. J- Jana Kiram, thank you. Agreeing about the semantic layer. Um, Heather, yeah. So you built your layer in Snowflake, and this is yep. something that ThoughtSpot reads directly. So a lot agreeing here. <laughs> um, so that that's good. Um, maybe, and, I, and I'll bring our other... Um, anti goods, which are tool agnostic, so you're not replicating, all a lot of agreement. Um, I'm gonna bring our other panelists back on because I think this applies to everyone. Um, So maybe do a quick round robin. Um, Andrew is asking, so multiple BI tools are okay if they all point to the same semantic layer. Nick, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what we've had. <clears throat> we've had to do many times. And, and I think Mike kind of mentioned this and I'll kind of pass it over to him. But, you know, having one of everything, I mean, that's that's the reality that a lot of folks have to live with, especially in very large organizations. As you said, Cindy, there's an adoption curve that happens. Um, but really, like my having worked at Etsy and Jet, the bane of my existence is when two people get different numbers for the same metric out of different reports. Right. And now we're talking about who set of numbers is right versus what to do about them or what the insight is. So that's really the key. Um, There are lots of ways to do it. I think that's typically the way that we do it is is build a consistent data model in something like a snowflake and then point multiple tools at it. Uh, But there's lots of ways to skin that cat, but that's, that's typically what we do. Great. Um, Anyone else want to add to that? Mike or Jessica, If if you were starting afresh, if you went to a brand new company, they had no BI tools, would you go for one? No, no, I wouldn't okay. because because invariably two things are gonna happen. First is you're gonna hire people, right? You're not gonna do it yourself. So people are gonna come with their experience and exposure to the tools, right? Yeah. They're gonna have, we talked earlier about religious wars, they're gonna have their favorite tool. Secondly, you want to have you know, varieties of spice of life, you want to be able to have just enough tools to, to serve up your community, but not too many tools that it becomes overly complicated to service them, to support them. Again, it, we're looking at from a perspective of just two, two tools, one of them being ThoughtSpot. We believe that the right number is two. We believe that because there's a crowded space in the BI reporting environment, if you look at Tableau, if you look at Power BI, if you look at Click, if you look at, now I'll go back and say the only thing that Click has, you know, over some of the others is if you're in a if you're in private equity, there's some calculations that inherent to Click does for private equity firms, but otherwise, really, they are very similar in nature in that they're reporting tools, they do slice and dice, they follow the Kimball, some of the Kimball models of dimensional modeling and so on. They all serve the same purpose. So 
you pick your you pick which religious religion you want to follow, and that, again that that depends on who you hire, and then I would say a thought spot which is completely differentiated from those other tools for the reasons I mentioned before are really the flavors that you go with. And I think two is the right number. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Jessica? Yeah, so I think, um, first I wanna say, yeah, I definitely think starting um, fresh, I completely agree with Mike there. I mean, people are gonna have their opinions, um, but I also think um, you don't know the, the business users and their, their capabilities yet when you come in. And depending on that, it, you might need you know, two tools, you might need three, you might need one, but I think it's that assessment phase is really important to, um, but going back to the sort of the semantic um, layer, I think you have to understand the data first before you can even answer that question. Um, and yeah. so making sure you have that semantic layer and that you have um, proper data governance, you have, you know, monitoring ETL processes in place um, and, you've got business definitions of your KPIs and everything down, and it doesn't come from one area, right? It needs, it, and when I say that is, two different departments have the a slightly different definition of the same KPI, right? And so there has to be alignment, um, you know, whether it's putting together a data governance committee with representation across um, all the unit, you know, all the departments, but there needs to be clear documentation of what the KPIs are, how they're calculated, and then that semantic layer should handle those. And if there, if you have multiple BI tools where um, you know you're using the tool front end to um, create some of those calculations, and you really have to be careful and diligent to make sure that um, that is you know consistent across. Um, because, like Nick said, I, there's yeah. nothing worse than getting you know people coming up with um, two different numbers. Um, and especially when it's because they write their own calculations and it's just slightly different, right? Yeah, yeah, good, thank you. There's so, I, I, there's so many great comments here and I really like to make sure we end with a few minutes buffer for everyone's next call. But I just wanna share, share Andy's agreeing. Um, there's a chat, it's preconceived ideas that worked before. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's not. I wanna take this from Andrew, because Andrew, I actually like those rogue departments or shadow IT, because sometimes that's where the innovation happens. So as long as they're not hiding it, and you're kind of looking, what's a new good idea? What's the next generation? But maybe, um, does anyone else wanna comment on that? Do you think this is a good thing, or are they rogue? Yeah, it's it's really, uh, or sorry, just gonna yeah, <laughs> just no, take no. it real quick. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I think you know, to your point, Cindy, they're, 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 these departments are using a new tool because something is not meeting their needs that exists, right? So that could be like you're saying, a new capability that they're looking for. It could be for whatever reason um, they don't have the data that they need in the centralized location, and and so you know, to your point, I think what we try to do when we see something like that happening is just dig a little bit deeper and ask why. I think there is sort of a, a Julie uh, made a comment and in, in, uh, in LinkedIn there about asking why, like, okay, well, what what yeah. what do you need from this tool that you can't get uh, from the other the other tools? Yeah, nice to hear from Julie. Inside secret, I think she was my editor like way back at Intelligent Enterprise. <laughs> so listen, um, I want to first off thank. Thank all, all of you um, for joining us virtually from around the world. Mike, Jessica, Nick, thank you so much for sharing your candid comments, your insights. Thank um, you. There's still more questions on LinkedIn. We'll try and get to those on demand and connect with each of these um, leaders. They're passionate about this space. A few more resources available to you on demand. Flex talked about their positioning. Um, that is available uh, on a YouTube channel. The podcast um, grant from Open Table, how he positions his products. The latest episodes from the Data Chief, the must read books from best authors in best tech from South Africa. Really good. And then save the date, September 28th. We have an awesome lineup of CDOs sharing a number of key topic, topics, measuring value, change, ethics, 
It's great. And then save the date. Thank you for making this your monthly habit of strategizing, learning together. So the next topic we're going to um, bravely take is this concept of the data fabric, the data warehouse versus the lake house. We've confirmed two of our guests, still looking to confirm the third one, but Chris D'Agostino from Capital One to field CTO of Databricks and Hamak Dangani, who is also the founder of ThoughtWorks, but she has come out with this awesome new book. Um, you can download the first four chapters exclusively at Starburst um, Data. So with everyone, I, I just say thank you, stay safe out there and have a great day. We look forward to seeing you online. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye.